Question 1. The first five terms of an arithmetic sequence are 1, 4, 7, 10, and 13. Write down an expression in terms of n for the nth term of this sequence. To get from one term to the other, we just add 3 each time, so the term-to-term -term rule is add 3. Repeated addition is multiplication, so the nth term of this sequence will be 3n plus something. To find out what the missing number is, we can take the first term or any term and replace the n with the term number. So if we take the first term, replace the n with the 1, we will have 3 times 1 plus something is equal to 1. The only way this is equal to 1 if we subtract 2. The nth term is equal to 3n minus 2. Question 2. Show that 2 one thirds times 3 three quarters is equal to 8 three quarters. Before we multiply them, we must convert the mixed numbers into improper fractions, that is, top-heavy fractions. To convert the first one, we do 2 times 3 plus 1. This will become 7 over 3. To convert the second one, we do 3 times 4 plus 3. This will become 15 over 4. Before we multiply, we can simplify the fractions. The highest common factor of 3 and 15 is 3, so we can divide both of these by 3. Then the 3 will become a 1 and the 15 will become a 5. Multiplying the numerators, 7 times 5 will become 35. Multiplying the denominators, 1 times 4 will become 4. To write 35 over 4 as a mixed number, we need to check how many times does 4 fit into 35. This is 8. 4 times 8 is 32, then we subtract this from 35, we can see that the remainder is 3. We write this on the top. This will be the numerator. With this we have shown that this is equal to 8 holes and 3 quarters as required. Question 3. We need to match these four graphs with the equations listed in the table. The first equation is y equals minus x cubed. This has a negative gradient, so the cubic graph will go downwards, so we match it with graph P. The second, y equals x cubed, has a positive cubic. This is graph C. y equals x squared is a quadratic. This is graph D. And finally, the last one is graph A, a reciprocal graph. Question 4. The diagram shows four triangles. Two of these triangles are congruent. Write down the letters of these two triangles. Congruent means that all angles and all sides are identical. First, we need to work out the missing angle, where we have enough information to do this. We know that angles in a triangle add up to 180. So the missing angle of the first triangle will be 80 because 180 minus the sum of the other two angles is equal to 80. We can now see that the last triangle has the same angles as the first one. Next, we want to check whether the sides are also identical. And they are, because the side opposite to the 80 degrees is 10 cm for both of these triangles. So the answer to this question is A and D. Question 5. Sean pays 10 pounds for 24 chocolate bars. He sells all 24 chocolate bars for 50p each. Work out Sean's percentage profit. To calculate the total sales, we look at the second row. 24 times 50 pence is 1,200 pence. This is equal to 12 pounds. The profit is 12 minus 10, which is 2 pounds. The percentage profit is 2 out of 10 times 100, which is equal to 20%. Question 6. ADC is a triangle. AED and ABC are straight lines. EB is parallel to DC. Angle EBC is 148 and ADC is 63 degrees. Work out the size of angle EAB. You must give a reason for each stage of your working. Angle BCD is co-interior with EBC. 
angle BCD is 180 minus 148 equals 32 degrees because co-interior angles add up to 180 degrees. ADC is a triangle. Angles in a triangle add up to 180 degrees. Angle EAB is equal to 180 minus the sum of 63 and 32 and this is equal to 85 degrees. We must remember to write a reason for each stage. Angles in triangles add up to 180. Question 7. The table shows information about the height in centimeter of a group of year 9 girls. This stem and leaf diagram shows information about the height in centimeter of a group of 15 year 9 boys. Compare the distribution of heights of the girls with the distribution of the heights of the boys. For these kinds of comparison questions, we must have two conclusions. One for the spread of the data, such as the range or interquartile range, and one for the central tendency, the average, such as the median. The range is highest number minus the smallest number. The range for the girls is 170 minus 150. This is 20 centimeters. Range for boys, 182 minus 158 is 24 centimeters. The height of the boys is more spread. They have higher range. The median of the girls is 165 centimeters, as we can see it in the table. To find out what the median of the boys is, we cross out the highest and the lowest numbers until we reach the middle number. The median is 168 centimeters. So the conclusion is the median height of boys is higher than the girls. Question 8. The diagram shows a prism placed on a horizontal floor. The prism has height 3 meters. The volume of the prism is 18 meter cubed. The pressure on the floor due to the prism is 75 newtons per meter squared. Work out the force exerted by the prism on the floor. The pressure is given. We are looking for the force. And we don't know the area, but we can work this out. The unit of the area is meter squared. If we divide the volume, meter cubed, by the height, meters, we will get the area in meter squared. So the area is 18 divided by 3, which is 6 meters squared. Using the formula for the pressure, this is force over area, replacing the values that we know, 75 is equal to force over 6. Rearranging this, the force is 75 times 6. This is equal to 450 newtons. Question 9. Write these numbers in order of size. Start with the smallest number. To be able to compare them easily, we will write them in standard form. The first number is already in standard form. The rest are not. Rewriting 67.2 in standard form will be 6.72 times 10. Timesing this by 10 to the power of minus 4 will be 6.72 times 10 to the power of minus 3. This is in standard form. Rewriting 672 in standard form will be 6.72 times 10 to the power of 2. Timesing this by 10 to the power of 4, we will have 6.72 times 10 to the power of 6. This is now in standard form. And finally, the last one will be 6.72 times 10 to the power of minus 4. Because there are four zeros in front of the six. 6.72 6 is the same for each of these numbers, so we need to look at the powers of 10. Minus 4 is the smallest power of 10. So the smallest number will be 0 0.000672. The next smallest power is minus 3. So the next number will be 67.2 times 10 to the power of minus 4. Then 6.72 times 10 to the power of 5, and finally 672 times 10 to the power of 4. Question 10. Given that a over b is equal to 2 over 5 and b over c is 3 over 4, find the ratio a to b to c. The ratio of a to b is 2 to 5. The ratio of b to c is 3 to 4. The lowest common multiple of 5 and 3 is 15. 
Now we have to write out an equivalent ratio where the b is 15. To get from 3 to 15, we times by 5. Timesing 4 by 5 is 20. To get from 5 to 15, we times by 3. 2 times 3 is 6. So the ratio of a to b to c is equal to 6 to 15 to 20. Question 11. Find the value of the fourth root of 81 times 10 to the power of 8. Step number 1. Rewrite the root as a power. The fourth root can be written as a power of a quarter. 81 is 9 to the power of 2. 9 can be further simplified as 3 to the power of 2. 3 to the power of 2 to the power of 2 is 3 to the power of 4. Because when we have brackets, we multiply the powers. We can replace 81 by 3 to the power of 4. Next step, we remove the brackets by timesing the powers. 3 to the power of 4 times a quarter times 10 to the power of 8 times a quarter. This will be 3 times 10 to the power of 2 is equal to 3 times 100, which is 300. Part B. Find the value of 64 to the power of minus half. First, we will deal with the negative power. A negative power gives us the reciprocal of the number. So this is equal to 1 over 64 to the power of a half. Power of a half means square root. Square root of 1 over 64 is equal to 1 over 8. Normally, these type of exam questions, they only require the positive answer. However, theoretically, this should be plus or minus 1 over 8. Part C. Write 3 to the power of n over 9 to the power of n minus 1 as a power of 3. Let's change 9 as 3 to the power of 2. This will give us 3 to the power of n over 3 to the power of 2 to the power of n minus 1. We remove the brackets by multiplying the powers. This will become 3 to the power of n over 3 to the power of 2n minus 2. Fraction is division. When we are dividing, we subtract the powers. This is equal to 3 to the power of n minus 2n minus 2. Simplifying this is 3 to the power of minus n plus 2. We can also write this as 3 to the power of 2 minus n. Question 12. The table gives information about the weekly wages of 80 people. Complete the cumulative frequency table. The first number is 5. The next number in the cumulative frequency table is for the wages from 200 to 300. So we have to keep adding on the frequencies from the first table. 5 plus 10 is 15. 15 plus 20, 35. 35 plus 20, 55, 55 plus 15, 70, and finally 70 plus 10 is 80. Part B. On the grid opposite, draw a cumulative frequency graph for your completed table. We start by plotting 0 with 200 because all the wages are above 200. For the next plots, we need the upper bounds with the cumulative frequency. 250 with 5, 300 with 15, 350 with 35, 400 with 55, 450 with 70, 500 with 80. Next, we join them without using a ruler, going point by point with a smooth curve. Part C. Juan says 60% of this group of people have a weekly wage of 360 pounds or less. Is Juan correct? You must show how you get your answer. To show our working, we find 360 on our graph, draw a vertical line all the way up to our curve, then a horizontal line to estimate the cumulative frequency at this point. This is 40. 40 people out of the total of 80 people represent 50%. Therefore, Juan is not correct only 50% have free 60 pound or less. Question 13. Liquid A and liquid B are mixed to make liquid C. Liquid A has a density of 70 kg per meter cubed. Liquid A has a mass of 1400 kg. 
Liquid B has a density of 280 kg per meter cubed. Liquid B has a volume of 30 meter cubed. Work out the density of liquid C. We can start by writing down the formula for the density. If you don't remember this, the clue is in the units, kilograms per meter cubed. The unit kilogram represents the mass, meter cubed represents the volume. The density of liquid A is equal to the mass of liquid A over volume of liquid A. The density is 70, the mass is 1400. We replace these in the formula to work out the volume. 70 equals 1400 over the volume. Rearranging these, volume equals 1400 divided by 70. The volume of liquid A is 20 meters cubed. It is always a good idea to start by writing out the formula and then replace the values that are given. The density of liquid B is 280 and its volume is 30. Rearranging these, the mass is equal to 280 times 30. This is equal to 8400 kilograms. Liquid C is obtained by mixing liquid A and liquid B. So the density of liquid C is equal to mass of A plus mass of B over volume of A plus volume B. Replacing the values, we have 1400 plus 8400 over 20 plus 30. This is equal to 196. Question 14. Sally plays two games against Martin. In each game, Sally could win, draw or lose. In each game they play, the probability that Sally will win against Martin is 0 0.3. The probability that Sally will draw against Martin is 0 0.1. Work out the probability that Sally will win exactly one of the two games against Martin. To solve this and to be able to visualize it better, I'm going to use the probability tree method. For game 1, the possibilities are win, draw, lose. We write the probabilities on the branches. All probabilities add up to 1. We can use this information to work out the probability that Sally will lose. 0 0.3 plus 0 0.1 is 0 0.4. 1 minus 0 0.4 is 0 0.6. This is the probability that Sally will lose. Now we can complete the branches of game 2 with the same probabilities. We need to work out the probability that Sally will win exactly one of the two games. If Sally wins the first game, the second game cannot be a win, it has to be a draw or a loss. The possibilities are win then draw. The probability of this is 0 0.3 times 0 0.1. We are multiplying as we go along the branches. This is equal to 0 0.03. It could be win then lose. The probability of this is 0 0.3 times 0 0.6 equals 0 0.18. If Sally draws the first game, the second game she must win. The probability of this happening is 0 0.1 times 0 0.3, which is 0 0.03. If Sally will lose the first game, the second game she must win. The probability of this is 0 0.6 times 0 0.3 equals 0 0.18. So these four scenarios are the four possibilities that Sally will win exactly one of the two games. Now we are using the OR rule where we add these probabilities. This gives us the answer that we are looking for, 0 0.42. Question 15. The straight line L1 has equation y equals 3x minus 4. The straight line L2 is perpendicular to L1 and passes through the point 95. Find an equation of line L2. Gradient of L1 is 3. The perpendicular gradient is minus 1 over 3. Therefore, the gradient of L2 is minus 1 over 3. Because if two lines are perpendicular, their gradients will multiply to minus 1. The form of an equation of a straight line is y equals mx plus c, where m is the gradient and c is the y-intercept. 
Replacing y, m and x, we have 5 equals minus a third times 9 plus c. Simplifying this, we get that c is equal to 8. Now we can write down the equation of line L2. y equals minus a third x plus 8. Question 16. Shirley wants to find an estimate for the number of bees in her hive. On Monday, she catches 90 of the bees. She puts a mark on each bee and returns them to her hive. On Tuesday, she catches 120 of the bees. She finds that 20 of these bees have been marked. Work out an estimate for the total number of bees in her hive. 90 out of the total marked can be written as 90 over x, x being the total number of bees. 20 out of 120 marked can be written as 20 over 120. Writing this out as a ratio marked to total, we have 90 to x and 20 to 120. Using a cross multiplication method, x is equal to 90 times 120 divided by 20. This is 540. This is the estimate for the total number of bees in her hive. Shirley assumes that none of the marks had dropped off between Monday and Tuesday. If Shirley's assumption is wrong, explain what effect this would have on your answer to part A. Her estimated total would increase, resulting in an overestimate. Which means the estimate would be higher than the actual number of bees. Question 17. Make F the subject of the formula. We have an F inside the bracket and one in the denominator. Our aim is to bring this together and make f the subject. Multiplying out the bracket, we have d equals 3 minus 3f three over f minus 4. Next, we need to get rid of the denominator. To do this, we times both sides by the denominator. This will result in d bracket open f minus 4 equals 3 minus 3f. Three Multiply the bracket. This is df minus 4d equals 3 minus 3f. Three Add 3f three to both sides. df plus 3f minus 4d equals 3. Add 4d to both sides, which results in df plus 3f equals 3 plus 4d. Now we must factorize f f bracket open d plus 3 equals 3 plus 4d. We have only one more step left. Our aim is to write this as f equals to something. So we have to get rid of that bracket by dividing both sides by the bracket. The result is f equals 3 plus 4d over d plus 3. Question 18. x is proportional to the square root of y where y is larger than 0. Using algebraic notation, we can write this like this. Replacing the proportionality sign, the formula will become x equals a constant k times square root of y. y is increased by 44%. This means that we are looking for 144% of y. Work out the percentage increase in x. We replace the y under the square root with 144% of y. Simplifying this will become 1.2 square root of y. Replacing square root of y in the initial formula, x becomes equal to 1.2 k square root of y. 1.2 as a percentage is 120%. This represents a 20% increase. Question 19. We've got two functions given fx and gx. For part a, we need to find g of 5. The function g of x is 3 times 2x plus 1. When we are asked to work out g of 5, all we have to do is replace the x with a 5. g of 5 is equal to 3 times 2 times 5 plus 1. Simplifying this will be 33. Part b. Find g of f of 9. When we have composite functions like this, 
a function within a function, we start with the inner function, f of 9. The function f of x is 12 over square root of x. We replace the x with a 9. Simplifying this, f of 9 becomes a 4. g of x is 3 times 2x plus 1. Replacing the x with f of 9, which we replace with a 4 because f of 9 is equal to 4, then replace x with a 4 in the g of x function. We have 3 times 2 times 4 plus 1. Simplifying this becomes 27. Part C. Find the inverse of g of 6. When we are aiming to find the inverse of a function, we tend to work with y's, so we replace the g of x with a y. This will become y equals 3 times 2x plus 1. Our goal here is to make x the subject of the formula. Subtracting 3 from both sides, then dividing by 6, x becomes y minus 3 over 6. This is the inverse that we are looking for. Now let's deal with the notation. This at the moment is in terms of y. However, a lot of times we are working with x's, so we would just have to replace the y with an x. We are looking for the inverse when x is 6. So let's substitute 6. 6 minus 3 over 6 is equal to half. Question 20. Show that this expression can be written in the form a plus square root of 5 over b, where a and b are integers. The aim of this question is to rationalize the denominator, then simplify it. There is a useful formula that can help us. This is a plus b times a minus b is equal to a squared minus b squared. This is the difference of two squares. Timesing the top and bottom by 5 square root of 5 plus 5 gives us an equivalent fraction that gets rid of the square root in the denominator. Let's multiply out the bracket in the numerator, then simplify it. Square root of 180 times 5 root 5 is 5 root 900. Square root 180 times 5 is 5 root 180. Minus 2 root 5 times 5 root 5 is minus 10 root 25. Minus 2 root 5 times 5 is minus 10 root 5. Square root of 900 can be written as square root of 9 times square root of 100. Root 9 is 3 and root 100 is 10. So square root of 900 is 30. 5 root 900 becomes 5 times 30. 180 is the same as 9 times 20, which is the same as 9 times 4 times 5. So what we are aiming for here is write 180 as the product of square numbers. Square root of 180 can be written as square root of 9 times square root of 4 times square root of 5. This is equal to 3 times 2 times square root of 5, which is 6 root 5. 5 square root of 180 becomes 5 times 6 root 5. Then minus 10 times 5 minus 10 root 5. Simplifying this further by collecting like terms will become 100 plus 20 root 5. Now let's simplify the denominator. 5 root 5 squared is 25 times 5 which is 125. In the denominator we will have 125 minus 25. We can now factorize 20, then cancel down this fraction. We divide top and bottom by 20. This becomes 5 plus root 5 over 5. We can split this fraction into 2. 5 over 5 plus root 5 over 5. This is equal to 1 plus root 5 over 5, where a is equal to 1 and b is equal to 5. Question 21. DEF is a triangle. P is the midpoint of FD. Q is the midpoint of DE. Vector FD is A and vector FE is B. Use a vector method to prove that 
PQ is parallel to FE. Because P is the midpoint, vector FP is half of A. Vector ED is EF plus FD minus B plus A. Because Q is the midpoint, vector EQ is half of ED, which is half times A minus B. Or half of A minus half of B. Now we have everything that we need to write out the vector PQ. To write out the vector PQ, we need to take the root from P to F to E to Q. This is a combination of vectors PF plus FE plus EQ. FP is half A, so PF will be minus half A. FE is B as it was given, and vector EQ is half A minus half B. Now let's simplify this. Half A minus half A will cancel each other out. B minus half B is half B. So PQ is half of FE. Now we have enough proof for our conclusion. Vector FE is a multiple of PQ, therefore they are parallel. Question 22. The diagram shows two shaded shapes A and B. Shape A is formed by removing a sector of circle with radius 3x minus 1 centimeters from a sector of the circle with radius 5x minus 1 centimeters. Shape B is a circle of diameter 2 minus 2x centimeters. The area of shape A is equal to the area of shape B. Find the value of x. You must show all your working. The formula for an area of a sector is theta over 360 times pi times r squared. The area of the shaded shape A is the difference of two sectors with an angle of 45 degrees. This is 45 over 360 times pi times 5x minus 1 squared minus 45 over 360 times pi times 3x minus 1 squared. We can factorize 45 over 360 pi. 5x minus 1 squared is 5x minus 1 times 5x minus 1. Multiplying this out and simplifying it will become 25x squared minus 10x plus 1. Multiplying out the brackets of 3x minus 1 squared and then simplifying it will give us 9x squared minus 6x plus 1. 45 pi over 360 will become pi over 8. Notice that there is a minus in front of the second bracket, which will change the sign of every single term inside the second bracket. The area of A is pi over 8 times 16x squared minus 4x. The shape P has a diameter 2 minus 2x. Its radius is half of this, 1 minus x. The area of B is pi times 1 minus x squared. This is equal to pi times 1 minus 2x plus x squared. Area of shape A is equal to area of shape B. The area of A is pi over 8, 16x squared minus 4x. This is equal to the area of B, which is pi times... 1 minus 2x plus x squared. Dividing both sides by pi, the pi will cancel out. 1 eighth times the bracket is 2x squared minus half x. The right hand side of the equation stays as it was, 1 minus 2x plus x squared. We moved everything to one side. We now have x squared plus 1.5x minus 1 equals 0. Now we have to solve this quadratic equation to find the x. Some of the common methods that we can use is quadratic formula, completing the square or factorizing. I'm gonna use the factorizing method. Ideally we want whole numbers for this, so we will times everything by 2. Now we have 2x squared plus 3x minus 2 equals 0. To get started we do 2 times minus 2, this is minus 4. Now we need all the factor pairs of minus 4 that add up to a positive 3. This is 4 and minus 1. 
because 4 times minus 1 is minus 4 and 4 plus minus 1 is 3. Next, we split the middle term, the free x, into 4x minus 1x. Now, we factorize the first two terms and the last two terms separately. Factorizing 2x plus 4x will become 2x times x plus 2. And factorizing minus 1x minus 2 will become minus bracket open x plus 2. We have the same bracket x plus 2, so we are on the right track. The fully factorized form will be x plus 2, the common bracket, and in the second bracket we write in the leftovers 2x minus 1. There are two solutions to this equation. From the first bracket we have x equals minus 2. This is not a valid solution in this case because we cannot have negative lengths, so we cross it out. We can find the second solution by making the second bracket equal to 0 and solve it for x. x is equal to half. This is the solution that we are looking for. Question 23. There are four types of cards in a game. Each card has a black circle or a white circle or a black triangle or a white triangle. The ratio of black shape to white shape is 3 to 5. The ratio of circle to triangle is 2 to 7. Express the total number of cards with black shape as a fraction of the total number of cards with triangle. The proportion of number of cards with a black shape is given by the fraction 3 out of 8. The 8 comes from adding 3 and 5. The proportion of number of cards with a triangle can be expressed by the fraction 7 out of 9, where 9 comes from adding 2 to 7. To be able to compare these two fractions, we want to have the same denominator. The lowest common multiple of 8 and 9 is 72. 3 over 8 can be written as 27 over 72. 7 over 9 can be written as 56 over 72. The question is asking us to find a fraction number of black shapes over the number of triangles. This is 27 out of 56. 